On today's show, after reviewing the Thomas Hurdle and Jake Gensel trades over the last two days, now we're going to be looking at the rest of the prospects that were picked, uh, that were traded at the NHL trade deadline. We'll talk about Jan Mishak, Jacob Perot, uh, Cade Weber, and a lot more on today's episode of Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, we break down everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakesh, joined by Sebastian High, and on today's show, we'll be breaking down the rest of the prospects that were traded at the NHL trade deadline after we reviewed the likes of David Edstrom, Billy Koivinen, Cruz Lucius, and Vasily Palomarov that were traded in the two big trades of the trade deadline um, in our episodes from Monday and Tuesday. Now we'll be, we're going to be looking at a couple more uh, of these prospects and kind of round out the rest of them. So we'll start off in our first segment by discussing uh, the trade between the Montreal Canadiens and the Anaheim Ducks, Jan Mishak for Jacob Perot. Um, in our second segment, we'll look at some of the uh, the other trades in there. So Cade Weber to Toronto, uh, Jack Thompson to San Jose, uh, and the swap of Jeremy Hansel and Graham Sward. And then in our final segment, we'll look at uh, Artyom Grushnikov, who was part of the Chris Tanev trade, um, who then went to Calgary, uh, Ofchinikov, Dmitry Ofchinikov going to Minnesota in the Connor Dewar trade. And a couple other ones in there. Before we get into any of that, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets with any $5 money line bet. That's $200 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. We're so close to 1,000. Help us get there. Uh, leave us a comment letting us know what you know what you think of the episode. And if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, please leave us a rate and review and make sure to make us your first listen of the day. So let's get things started here with this Young Mishak for Jacob Pro trade. This isn't necessarily the, the biggest trade of the uh, trade deadline by any means, but I think it's a trade that really hints at the philosophies of both of these teams. So, you know, we can start off with the profiles of both of these guys, but overall, what did you what did you think of this trade overall? What does it hint at, and what makes it so interesting for us? Certainly, I, f- I fully agree. So uh, the Montreal Canadiens already have a have swaths of players that, that project as like bottom of the lineup and NHLers, especially like among forwards, I mean, defensemen as well, honestly, like Montreal's depth of prospects is is deep. And Jan Mishak uh, has had a bit of a better season this year than he than he did last season, but still was not really in contention of, of being able to crack Montreal's lineup in the next two or three years. And uh, the Ducks could use a player like Jan Mishak, who has has kind of adjusted his game since being drafted. He was a bit more like pacey and, and high skill uh, as a draft eligible playing with the Hamilton Bulldogs in uh, 2021 and uh and since then has focused this game a little bit more on the finer details of the game so the anaheim ducks i think are getting a player here who has a higher likelihood of becoming an nhl or than jacob perot but the montreal canadians are getting the only player in this deal that has any shot at like middle six upside jacob perot is really really skilled horribly inconsistent and and but a skilled goal scorer with impressive handling capabilities uh some flashes of playmaking ability he can really like take some games by the horn and 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 make a massive difference and tilt the ice in his team's favor and he's done so at the ahl level especially earlier on this season his last stretch of games has not been the strongest he's only logged a single assist in his last 10 games but he does have 18 uh, points through 31 games with the san diego gulls in the ahl and was at close to a point of game uh prior to this 10 the, the, the slower 10 game stretch so with jacob perot the montreal canadians are getting uh well a a, a quebec uh a quebec born player uh also the son of yannick perot so you you have you have that like homegrown talent uh aspect here that is certainly of course always a factor with the montreal canadians uh but 
the chances of him becoming a middle sixer are relatively slim in my eyes. Like I wouldn't say they're anywhere higher than like 15 or 20%. It's an outside shot, but it is a shot at offensive upside and skill and goal scoring that the Montreal Canadiens lack in their pool. So being able to add a player like that in a swap deal where sure you're losing out on a player that will in all likelihood will ha- will have more NHL appearances at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. But will do so in a more restricted role. So I, I quite like this for both teams. The Ducks are going to get a player that will be able to play some solid fourth line minutes moving forward in, in maybe two or three years time. And the Habs are getting a swing at, at, at middle six goal scoring. So I, I like this from both perspectives. Both players could use a change of scenery. I think it makes sense on a lot of fronts. And these are also two teams with, pre- with pretty solid professional scouting staffs. So they definitely yeah. both knew what they were doing with this deal. For sure. What really stands out for me is how both team, both players fit their new team's needs so well. So you mentioned how the Habs have a lot of prospects who project as bottom six NHLers, and Jan Mishak was part of that big glut. Um, but I also think for Anaheim, they have pretty much five of their six top six spots pretty much down pat for the next, you know, 10 years uh, with the prospects that they have in the pool. You know, you talk about the, you know, them adding Cutter Gochi recently, but already having the likes of Tre- Trevor Zegras and Mason McTavish and Leo Carlson and all those guys, I think five of their top six slots are taken. So you're basically betting on Jacob Perot, you know, slotting into that second line wing role. And that's about it in terms of roles for him, because I don't think Perot is effective, even if he, even if he develops perfectly i don't think he would be effective in a bottom six role meanwhile the the issue with anaheim's uh system and the prospects they have is that i don't think they have enough complementary pieces versatile pieces who can play defensive minutes who can four check who can penalty kill and that's a great fit for Jan mishak i think that this is a a trade that's really a win-win for both teams and really fits both roles really well. Just to kind of break down both of these guys' game. Uh, Jan Mishak, like you said, when he was drafted, he was a bit more of that pacey kind of high skill player who was trying things in transition. He still got that element to his game, but it's a lot more muted and it's complemented by really, really good habits. That's what really stands out when you're watching Mishak is that he makes really good decisions and he's constantly scanning. He's constantly stopping, um, stopping his net drives at the net instead of kind of skating through the skating through the blue paint, that kind of stuff. You know, on the back check, he back checks hard, but also paces himself in, in on back checks and makes really good decisions when it comes to which player to stick to when he's going de- back down the ice. So, you know, the habits with Mishak are really good, but he's a player who's o- relatively offensively limited. Um, to a point where, you know, I could see him become kind of a third or fourth line energy winger. Whereas with Jacob Perot, it's a complete opposite where he's he's a pure goal scorer. His goal scoring ability is fantastic. For me, it's the best of his of his tools, even though the, the stick handling is really good. I think the shot is just so powerful, so accurate, it just flies off his stick. But on top of that, I mean he scored a Michigan this year. He's he's able he's able to do these kinds of things. Like he's got the offensive skill for it. But on the flip side of that, you're getting nothing out of him defensively and he's not going to be good for you in a bottom six. Like he's not going to be able to play his role with teammates. He needs to be the offensive driver on his line. So you're trading a versatile player who's a surefire NHLer for a boomer bust, pure skill guy. And the Habs are happy with this. The Ducks are happy with this. I think it's a trade that benefits both sides perfectly. Um, how do you, how do you rate this one for both teams? A minus both ways. I, I think both play both both teams got what they needed, as, as he mentioned. Like the Ducks yeah. have a bunch of also like, like, like players that are kind of along the same lines as Jacob Perot in their system. I'm thinking of players like Sasha Pastajov, for instance, uh, where yep. you have this high end goal scoring ability, but a real lack of defense, and he might slot into a top six if anything if everything ends up going great with his development moving forward, which is the same uh, projection as it is with Jacob Perot. Um, yeah, and yeah, I think I think the Montreal Canadiens could really use this type of goal scoring upside, even if it just ends up benefiting fitting the Laval rocket adding a goal scoring element uh is really quite helpful especially a young goal scoring element like in terms of raw goal scorers in Laval you have Emil Heineman and Logan Lyson. Mayu I mean That's right like, like, yeah. yeah yeah right and, and 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 adding a young player to the fold who is really capable of putting the puck in the net when you already have young players that are very capable playmakers such as Sean Farrell and Zavi Simonou 
I think it makes a lot of sense. Of course, you're also adding the French Canadian aspect, which is always a plus for the Montreal Canadiens. So I, I like this trade for both teams quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, also Gay Pro's uh, well, he's also Gay Pro's dad, but Jacob Pro's dad um played for the Habs for three years. He's a big part of the history in this in this uh in this market. So yeah, this is a great trade for both teams. We'll get into the other traded prospects in uh, the uh, at the trade deadline, including Jack Thompson, Cade Weber, uh, and uh, Graham Sward and Jeremy Hansel after these messages from our sponsors at Sleeper and eBay Motors. It's past the halfway point of the NHL season with the trade deadline now in our rearview mirror, but there's still time for you to get in on the action with Sleeper. Sleeper is our number one choice for all of your daily fantasy hockey needs here at the Lockdown NHL Podcast Network, because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey contests. And all you need to do to win that is to correctly predict the outcome of eight specific player stats. And you can get really creative with that if you so desire, whether you want to bet on some recent trade deadline acquisitions performing and, and, and putting up some goals and assists in the coming weeks, such as Jake Gensel, for instance, or if you want to maybe go along the lines of the topic of our podcast and bet on some of the, the young studs of the league, the Connor Bedards, Leo Carlson's, the Adam Fantilli's, and so on and so forth. The choice is yours with Sleeper. Use promo code LOCKEDONNHL and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code LOCKEDONNHL. See Sleeper's terms of use for details and locational availability. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and far more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what it is that you are looking for with eBay Motors. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, which is available to, the, to U.S. customers only, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to, tur to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Alrighty, so moving on to our second segment, we'll be talking about some other prospects that were traded at this trade deadline, and we're actually just going to be talking about defensemen in the second segment. But we'll start off with Cade Weber going to Toronto for their sixth round pick in the 2026 NHL draft. Uh, not a big trade by any means, but I found it really interesting in terms of what, what Toronto's doing here with this acquisition. Um, this is very much the the new old school, I guess you could call it, uh, for, for Toronto. It's going back to, to fundamental hockey basics, big physical defensemen. Uh, you know, we've seen a bit of that philosophy at the trade deadline with acquisitions like Joel Edmondson and Ilya Lyubushkin. You know, Cade Weber's kind of in that mold. He's a six foot six, almost six foot seven, two hundred pound defenseman. Um, uh, he's left-handed, and he was drafted in the 2019 NHL draft at 99th overall by the by the Hurricanes. Um, and the Hurricanes didn't really, I guess, see a path for him forward with the team. Maybe he wasn't going to sign there, and the Toronto Maple Leafs opted to take a shot at him. And Carolina gets a free six out of it, but just. Just to kind of break down his game, uh, he has six points in 31 games this season with Boston University, which is one of the most stacked NCAA rosters uh, in the league. So don't expect an offensive dynamo out of Cade Weber, but he's got leadership ability. He's got a physical game. He's a bruiser. He's able to punish you if you try to go his way in transition. Uh, and he clears the net front. He's your fundamental big physical boy who can't do much with the puck. So <laughs> that's mainly it. And talk us through the fun fact we figured out just before recording this about Cade Weber's production over the past five years. Yeah, for sure. So like as a D plus one, first of all, uh, Cade Weber played in the BCHL uh, with Penticton after being a USHS prep player in his draft year, where he put up five points in 23 games, which is not perhaps the production you expect for a drafted player as a D plus one in the BCHL, but in the yep. four consecutive NCAA seasons since then, he has logged a total of 16 points. So uh, in the five seasons since being drafted, he's logged 21 points, which is uh, significantly less than uh, a player that he's played a lot with this season has logged this season in Lane Hudson. 
Yep, that's uh, that's wild. That is absolutely wild. And you'd expect Weber to just even even kind of just luck himself into a secondary assist by playing with Lane Hudson so often, but uh, he has not. So yeah, just a uh, your 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 prototypical physical defenseman like this kid in the in the early two thousands would have been a first round pick probably. Uh, <laughs> but, Moving on to our next trade, and I think this is a really good one for San Jose. Um, they've tra- they traded Anthony Duclair to uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning and got Jack Thompson out of it. And Thompson's looking really good this season. He's a 21 year old, six foot one, 200 pound right handed defenseman, and he's well over half a point a game. Uh, last time I checked, I think it was 32 points in 45 games, something like that, in the AHL. Um, he played one game in the NHL really by default because Tampa basically lost her entire decor. Uh, to injuries this year um and yeah he's looking really really good i love the two-way decision making with thompson that's what really stands out the most thompson's just a really really good decision maker in transition um going both ways in the offensive zone i i like the little give and goes from the point the small area plays that he makes um really translatable plays from him as well you know he he's definitely a you know Tampa is really good at picking up late round picks and it's really, you know, it's, it's a, it's by default because you don't have much other choice. Uh, but I think Jack Thompson was one of their better prospects. And for me, I, I mean, I have a hard time not seeing a 30 point, you know, number four, number five, two way defenseman out of Jack Thompson, which is decent value in that trade. And I think the, the other part of that trade was what a third going to San Jose and a seventh going to Tampa, something like yeah. that. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it's decent value for a player who, you know, if you're trying to tank, you got to get rid of these guys. And it was a buyer's market, and I think the the, the Sharks did the best with that. Um, and then our final trade of the second segment was um, a, a big part of the Yakov Trenin trade, which I found really interesting. Nashville and Colorado swapping 21-year-olds uh, overage drafted defensemen. Um, we'll start with Jeremy Hansel. He's been having a decent season, about a point per game, but nothing overwhelming there. Um but Graham Sward, I'm a big fan of. Uh, what What do you like about uh, Graham Sward's game? I'm actually going to start with Hansel because I've watched more of Hansel and you've watched more of Sward, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll adjust that way. Okay, let's uh, do that. Jeremy Hansel's a really intelligent, underrated player that I've I've been quite a big fan of uh, for a couple years now in terms of of like underrated defensemen that are kind of going under the radar and. Uh, and he, I was very happy to see him drafted in that 2022 NHL, uh, NHL draft, uh, 2023 draft. Sorry, he he was just drafted in Nashville yeah. uh, by the Colorado uh, Avalanche and is now being traded to Nashville. So he's back to the city where he was drafted. And uh, I've I've liked his year to year progression. He's adding further details to his game uh, every single time. I, I go back to watch the Seattle Thunderbirds, and it's not a great team this season. So the production isn't nearly as good as Graham Swords is in Wenatchee. But uh, I, I've really liked the decision making with Jeremy Hansel. Uh, he's very much possession oriented, uh, really, really smart in terms of like when he's under pressure, he will cycle, he will circle back at, to access space and and uh, give the puck to a teammate who's in a safe position uh, rather than trying to force things. And I think there's a decent chance of Jeremy Hansel being either a high end AHL defenseman or a dependable bottom pairing guy. Yeah, for sure. And uh, moving on to Graham Sward, uh, he was picked in the second round, uh, sorry, in the fifth round, uh, 146 overall in the 2022 NHL draft um, by the Nashville Predators. They swapped him with Hansel. I get the I get the mindset here. It's just Sward is younger and is producing at an absurd level right now uh, in the WHL with Wenatchee. He's got 76 points in 59 games from that blue line. We're talking about a six foot three, almost 200 pound defenseman uh, who can move the puck. Well, he's got really good skating. Um, I really like the positioning in, uh, in transition, uh, both on the puck and off the puck. Those are two great areas of his game. Um, I love his stretch passing as well. It's a great area of his game. I, I've watched a decent amount of Wenatchee, and he always stands out to me. And uh, yeah, I was surprised to see that he was drafted in the fifth round as an overager. But then I realized he's born on September 12th uh, of 2003. So yeah. uh, although he was an overager, he was born three days earlier than the cutoff, which I mean, he's basically he was basically drafted in his draft year. Uh, uh, but. But yeah, a really interesting prospect who I'm, I'm really happy to see get a shot with the Avalanche. I think they could do a really good job with Sword uh, and make him a really decent NHL for them and never put it past the Colorado Avalanche to take an underrated defenseman and turn it into something nope. good. Uh, looking at you, Devontae. 
Braves. So that wraps things up for our second segment. We'll talk about some more prospects in our third that were involved in trades at the trade deadline. Uh, we'll mainly focus on um, the likes of Artem Grishnikov going to Calgary and Dmitry Ovchinikov going to Minnesota. But we also have a couple more to discuss. That's all coming up after these messages from our sponsors at FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every single game of the tourney. Whether you're putting, whether you're betting big on an upset or on a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 bucks that you can spend on anything ranging from spreads to money lines to single-game parlays, for instance. You can even bet who you think is going to win it all. I know single-game parlays are always a personal favorite of mine because they just add a ton of excitement when you're attending a game live specifically and uh, make things a little bit more interesting. Just visit fanduelcom slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Alrighty, so closing things off with our final segment here, we'll be talking about some more prospects from uh, that were traded at the trade deadline. We'll start with Artyom Grushnikov, who was a, a decent part of the Calgary uh, return for Chris Tanev. Um, I was surprised to see him, in, you know, being held in such high praise because you look at the production and it's not necessarily the most overwhelming, but watching more tape of his, you can really see what he's good at. Um, we talked about your bona fide kind of physical shutdown defenseman in Cade Weber. Uh, Grushnikov Nikov, I think, is a bit more of an elevated version of that, where there's more translatability, there's more uh, solid decision-making, and there's more comfort and poise on the puck uh, with Grushnikov, even though he's not necessarily the type to, to make make fantastic, you know, three lane, three line stretch passes and, you know, deke through the opponents in transition or anything like that. He does his job really well and pairs it with really good decisions. Uh, right. So, you know, what's your, what's your take on the return for Tanev in this trade and, and what part does Grushnikov play in this? For sure. I mean, I, I heard that that uh, Grushnikov was was valued at the level of a first round draft pick in this return from Calgary's perspective, which I, I can't say I fully agree with. I think that with Grushnikov, you're getting a number four or number five at best uh, in, in terms of being like the physical defensive presence on like a third pairing, uh, perhaps like the, the, the solid part of that pairing uh, pair with a more offensive leaning player. But uh, he's a solid prospect. I, th I think he fits Calgary's identity a ton. Uh, like the Calgary Flames have really been focusing on on adding uh, physicality and, and, and really hard nose play uh, since Craig Conroy uh, took over uh, from um, from Brad Tree Living uh, last year. So uh, we saw that at the draft, but when, while they were targeting guys like Samuel Hanzek and Adar Sunia, for instance, and Grushnikov totally plays in with that philosophy. So uh, very much a Calgary style player uh, through and through. Uh, kind of funny that he's got coming back in the Chris Tanev trade because like the absolute high upside with Grushnikov is like a Chris Tanev light and stylistically could be a little bit similar. I think that the breakout passing would be one big difference there that, that, that Grushnikov does not have that, that Chris Tanev excels at, but in terms of that, that defensive presence and the way that he approaches the, the defensive game in terms of waiting for the right moment to strike. And then when he does to do so with overwhelming physicality and aggression, uh, it, it, there are definitely some, yeah. some stylistic links there. Yeah, for sure. Um, by the way, the the total uh, cost that Dallas um, that Dallas paid to get Chris Tanev was obviously Grushnikov, um, and uh, they also got Cole Brady, who's a goaltender prospect. Uh, and so they gave up Grushnikov, a second round pick, a third round pick, and then a fourth round pick to New Jersey for brokering that deal and retaining twenty five percent of the salary there. Uh, so a, a decent a decent haul for me for Calgary. Um, and I understand what they mean about Grushnikov being kind of the main element of that. But for me, that's it, really on pair with a mid to late second round pick in terms of the value you're getting out of Grushnikov. But it's really a philosophical thing because you ask one team and they'll value a number four, number five shutdown defenseman at a third round pick or a fourth round pick. And others will value him at a first. So that that's pretty variable. Uh, moving on to Dmitry Ovchinikov going to Minnesota along with a fourth round pick in exchange for Connor Dewar. Um, Dewar is really kind of your, your, your bottom six kind of grinder uh, type of NHLer. 
not necessarily you know a high skill guy, but a guy you, you can't help but love in the locker room who's got really great energy and and a fantastic motor, and that's what's really got him to the NHL. For me, Toronto probably could have been a bit more patient with Ovchinikov, but the the other issue is, I mean, how how much more patient can you be? Um, he's got 10 points in 20 games right now in the AHL, but Ovchinikov has always been one of my favorite prospects. You know, watching him a lot in his draft year, and that being kind of the one of the first years that I really started taking scouting seriously. Um, I loved Ovchinikov's transition skill, his ability to switch lanes and transition, find little pockets, and kind of burst through the neutral zone and, and create something offensively. He's always been a plus. I've loved the effort level. I've loved the skill level as well. Um, but yeah, it just hasn't really worked out in Toronto with the Marlies. Uh, what do you think it is about Ovchinikov's game that's really holding him back um, from being kind of a, a top AHLer at this point? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, he's young. Like, he's only turning 22 in August. So he's a young player. He was just drafted in 2020. So the development curve there is certainly still a work in progress. And, I mean, if, even if you look back uh, onto his production from last season, he played almost the entire season in the KHL uh, where he logged 68 games and just 13 points, right? Like, he's very much still developing, and that was c- – also quite clear in his draft year right like like the super intriguing thing with Avchinikov was the raw skill the raw potential but it was still quite theoretical in mm-hmm. terms of what that would actually look like in reality there's still a lot of moving parts in in making that work and I think that Minnesota's system is one where where he will excel in that development I mean of course Minnesota quite likes their highly skilled Russians as, we, as we've seen with uh, players like uh, like Kirill Kaprizov, but also more recently now with uh, Murat Kuznetinov. They like their skilled Russian players and and Ovchinikov certainly fits that mold. And the nice thing is that in Minnesota, there won't be a rush for him either. Uh, he can just kind of simmer along and he'll likely need another like like two or so years before he, he can make the jump to the NHL and be, be consistently effective. But once he does make that jump, there's, there's a non-zero chance that he ends up being a really, really, really entertaining middle six presence but there's also a, a certainly a, a decent chance that he never ends up being an, NH, an, an nhl at all so a decent piece to add into the, the, the trade if i'm minnesota i like it uh but but the fourth round draft is also a nice little swing to take yeah for sure and especially for what they're paying there i don't think it's really much of an issue there um uh, doer was a player that they could afford to give away and toronto was really looking for a player in his style so i think this is a good fit uh and a decent return uh um, but that wraps things up for today's show. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next. And if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, make sure to make us your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, make sure to check out Lockdown Sports today. They've got all your news and updates about what's going on around sports. And make sure to tune in for our next shows as we continue our prospect coverage for the month of March. This has been Hattie Kalakesh with Sebastian High, and we hope you tune in next time.